In the aftermath of Frederick the Great's impressive victory at Rosbach, the dynamics of the war changed significantly. Things were finally looking up for Prussia, although their position was far from safe. The French retreat at Rosbach was marked, according to Fraser, by more than a customary atrocity. Destruction was indiscriminate, churches and altars were defiled, the country, people, treated deplorably. Despite this, Frederick could not shake the uneasy feeling of defeating his former allies. I can never get used to looking on the French as my enemies. Rosbach at best allowed Frederick to focus on other dangers, mainly the Austrians. Frederick knew this. He later wrote, strictly speaking, the Battle of Rosbach merely afforded me the freedom to go in search of new dangers in Silesia. Upon his success, Frederick's cousin, King George II of England, reconsidered the Peace of Klosterzeven and rejoined the war on Prussia's side. His son, the Duke of Cumberland, had been a disappointment. Frederick knew just the man for the job. Frederick's brother-in-law, Ferdinand, Duke of Brunswick, took over. His British-financed army would control the Western Front fighting several iconic battles. So the Western, Northern and Eastern Fronts of the war were relatively under control, or no. But that did not mean Frederick was free of worry. The Austrians were dead set on crushing the Prussian army in Silesia. Silesia lay more or less open for them after the Austrian victory at the Battle of Moise. Sure, Bavern fought all the way during his retreat, but heavily outnumbered, there was not much he could do. His retreat sacrificed strong points of defense. As Trolls pursued Bavern with the characteristic Austrian sluggishness, he dispatched a 12,000 strong force under Ernst Dietrich Freier von Marschall. He held Lusatia, protecting the flank of the Austrians moving into Silesia. One day after his victory at Rosbach, Frederick collected his tired and his worn down army, likely no more than 15,000 men. A grueling march lay before them. Autumn and early winter were an unusual time for a campaign such as this one, but for now, the mild weather assisted him. Prince Henry maintained Leipzig, and Keith took an army of equal size to make a faint attack against Prague and hopefully split up the Austrian army. We have to briefly look more in depth at the Austrian operations in Bohemia, Silesia and Saxony the month before Rosbach. Already in October, worrying information reached Frederick. Early that month, General Nadashti laid siege to the iconic fortress of Schweidnitz, with some 43,000 soldiers and plenty of big guns. Bavern did manage to successfully pull back to Breslau. However, Breslau was in a very poor shape. Its population wasn't pro-Prussian and its walls and defenses were crumbling. Bavern decided to entrench his army in the southern suburbs of the city. All this happened in early October, but as we have come to know the Austrian campaigning, it stagnated thanks to the slow decision making. This window provided Bavern with a very welcome opportunity to prepare for the approaching battle. As for Schweidnitz, the fortress held out against multiple assaults and continuous bombardments for over a month. They did not surrender until November 12, after inflicting heavy casualties against the Austrians. But the fortress was reduced to mostly rubble, the Austrians won. They captured 180 guns, 48 colors, 333,600 thalers, two months worth of rations and nearly 6,000 prisoners, among them four generals and nearly 200 officers. The Austrians lost 3,000 men, of whom 1,200 killed. This opened the road to Breslau and it freed Nadashti's troops. They joined Prince Charles's army, which now numbered over 80,000 men. When news of Schweidnitz's capitulation reached Frederick, he was livid. He wrote Bavern, he blamed him personally for the loss of the fortress since he didn't mount a relief effort. If Bavern and Generals Friedrich Kiau and Johann Lestwitz continued to act like old horses, they would answer with their heads, as would all other generals who allowed themselves to be ruled by cowardice and weakness. Meanwhile, word of Frederick's victory at Rosbach reached the Austrian camp. They realized the Prussian king would surely attempt to thwart their advance. Prince Charles did not feel like fighting in front of Breslau, but Maria Theresa and Dawn overruled him. When Frederick arrived at his quarters close by, heavy bombardment and gunfire were audible. He didn't know it yet, but later learned the Austrians stormed Bavern's camp in what became the Battle of Breslau. 
The Battle of Breslau was quite a muddled affair with multiple fronts going on. Prince Charles commanded up to 85,000 soldiers, at least 60,381 infantry in 96 battalions, 93 grenadier companies, and 23,220 cavalry in 141 squadrons. Additionally, he fielded 228 artillery pieces. In contrast, Davron commanded between 21 and 28,400 troops, 40 battalions, and 102 squadrons. The Prussians were significantly outnumbered. However, the Oder and Loa provided impossible defenses. Bavern positioned the Prussian army between Kozel in the north and Grebschen in the south. His lines extended to Neudorf in the east. His army was snugly entrenched with infantry defending strategic villages. He hoped it would make up for his numerical inferiority. Zieten held the Prussian left between Grieten and Kleinburg. Lieutenant General von Lestwitz commanded infantry at Höfgen. The Prussians erected defenses south of Grebschen and Gabitz. The battle was preceded by two days of heavy artillery shelling from both sides. The Austrians, mauled by heavy fire, installed seven pontoon bridges across the Lower, three northwest of Schmeidfeld, and four southeast of Kleinmückberg. In the early morning of November 22, the Austrians finished deploying from Masowitz all the way to Hartley. The cavalry followed the infantry. Charles on the left, Nadashti on the right. The reserves under General Witt deployed behind Groß Mückberg. The battle commenced with Nadashti's three columns advancing across the pontoon bridges. He wanted to attack the entrenchments at Gabitz. Meanwhile, to the far north, Beck advanced from the northwest. He quickly expelled a minor Prussian force holding Ostwitz. Then he installed three artillery pieces on the banks of the Oder, launching volleys for the remainder of the day. The Duke of Bavern did not believe Charles's main attack would be across his western flank, reinforcing Zieten's flank. Nadashti's grenadiers launched an attack against Kleinburg. Neither commander dared to commit their full force. The outnumbered Prussian battalion defended the village with vigor. Battle continued for a while, but they ended up yielding the village and took their positions to the north. When the infantry to the north launched a counterattack, the Austrians fled the village. Zieten's hussars chased the fleeing Austrians. Nadashti ordered his entire army to retreat to their original positions. As the status quo returned, Zieten relayed to Bavern how Nadashti's sizable force would surely attempt another counterattack. In the event, Nadashti would not. But for the remainder of the battle, Zieten and Nadashti remained face to face, not engaging in combat. This was especially bad for the Prussians, as it hogged valuable manpower. To the west, the fighting was much more intense. Right after noon, the entire Austrian army, including reserves, began their march across the pontoon bridges. Additionally, some light infantry and 1,000 regular infantry crossed the dense Pilsnitz forest from the north to launch an attack against the Prussian right flank. The army crossing the bridge at Groß Mückberg rapidly advanced. They faced fierce resistance at Klein Mückberg and suffered an infantry charge between Klein Mückberg and Grabschen. Lieutenant General Pinover led his cuirassier brigade against the Austrian infantry. Sustaining heavy casualties, they barely inflicted any damage. During the charge, Pinover was mortally wounded. By this time, the Austrians seized the abandoned trenches, installing their artillery there. Shortly thereafter, the entire Prussian infantry was evicted from the villages and the Austrians took over. The infantry began their retreat towards the entrenchments near Gabitz. Bavern ordered several cavalry squadrons to launch another cavalry charge against the Austrian grenadiers holding caption. But thanks to additional reinforcements, the cavalry was easily repelled. Lestwitz's left flank was threatened by the Austrians holding these villages. As combat continued between Klein Mückbern and Grebschen, McGuire and Arenberg had crossed the Lower from Neukir towards Schmiedfeld. Because they were exposed to the Prussian artillery, they suffered many more casualties, but their attack against the entrenchments around Schmiedfeld favored them. Heavy combat commenced, as the Prussians reportedly resisted until all ammunition was expended. Reinforcements sent by Lestwitz could not change the course of the battle. Near Hüfgen, 
Lviv launched a frontal charge against the weakening infantry. They resisted until the Austrians around Klein Mugbe were close to circling around them. The assault in the north focused beyond Pilsnitz. Jau and Leswitz desperately defended the crossing against overwhelming numbers, not to mention the increasing danger of flanking from the south. The marshy and uneven terrain, in combination with accurate Prussian artillery shelling, saw Austrian casualties mount. Supported by cavalry, the infantry launched three charges against the redoubts around Pilsnitz. Both sides suffered heavy casualties, but each time the Austrians were driven back. To their north, the Prussian Feldjäger engaged in guerrilla light warfare against the Austrian Grenzers trekking through the Pilsnitz forest. These skirmishes continued throughout the day but saw no fruitful incursions by the Austrians. As the sun began setting at 5.30 pm, the Austrians launched their fourth assault. This time, it proved successful. The Prussian infantry retreated and the Austrians rapidly seized the strong points, but could not continue past the trench and suck behind them. They didn't want to anyway. It was getting too dark. Behind the front lines throughout the day, Bavern had scrambled to collect forces and launch a counterattack. He decided Viet's reserve corps was the most viable target. At around 6 pm, he collected 14 battalions ready to launch an attack. When they launched against the Austrians at Schmiedfeld, Hüfgen and Klein Mückberg, Heavy combat around the villages followed. The Prussian assault was only broken thanks to the intervention of Austrian cavalry on both flanks, threatening to cut them off. Klein Gandau became Prussia's most forward base. No attempts were made to attempt and seize it. The armies fought for 15 hours that day. The front extended 11 kilometers. It can safely be said the Austrians had the upper hand, but the Prussians sure fiercely resisted, despite being outnumbered nearly 3 to 1. Only Zitten's wing maintained its original positions, thanks to Nadashti's inaction. It is unclear what happened that night. Some sources indicate Bavern wanted to launch a counterattack the following morning. Other sources indicate he ordered the general retreat. All that is for sure is that during nighttime, in utter silence, the Prussian army began its retreat via Breslau across the Oder. General Lestwitz and 10 battalions remained behind to defend Breslau against the inevitable siege. The casualties were significant. The Prussians lost 6,350 men, at least 800 killed, among whom one general and 150 officers. Three generals were mortally wounded, another 3,800 men deserted, and some 700 were captured. In total, the Austrian casualties numbered some 5,800. 649 soldiers and 44 officers were killed. 235 officers and 4,464 men were wounded. Another 460 went missing. They lost one general and six wounded. The way the Battle of Breslau ended was perhaps a bit sudden and definitely wasn't a traditional victory or defeat. The retreat, though arguably understandable, did not sit well with Frederick. The Prussian king was close to the battle after all. Bavern certainly felt his wrath. It just so happened as he retreated, Bavern received the king's opinion on the fall of Schweidnitz. He could guess the king's response to his retreat from Breslau. That night, Bavern stumbled upon an Austrian outpost. He supposedly mistook it for a Prussian outpost and allowed himself to be captured. It is generally believed this was done on purpose in order to avoid the likely capital punishment Frederick threatened him with. Bavern was eventually taken to Vienna and after one year he was later released without asking for ransom thanks to his family ties to the royal family. Upon his return to Prussia, Frederick appointed him as governor of Stettin, but not before again fighting on the Prussian side. Though the king continued to despise him, the capture of Breslau added another one, and frankly the final Silesian stronghold to the Austrian tally. They controlled the province now. To the west, Frederick commanded an army outnumbered at least three to one, just like at Rosbach, the future of his kingdom depended on what happened next. Against all rules of warfare, Frederick decided to seek the confrontation with the much larger army. It culminated 
in the legendary Battle of Leuten. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there's a topic, battle, or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and my channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will receive early access to my videos without any in-video advertisements, and your name will be featured at the end of every video. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.